Good afternoon, everybody. We're about to get started. Welcome. This lecture series is named in honor of Professor Brainerd Curry, who taught contracts, admiralty, and conflicts of laws at Duke from 1946 to 1949 and from 1961 to 1965. He was a nationally renowned scholar in the conflicts field. Uh, he was an admired scholar and a beloved teacher here at Duke. He also taught at various other schools, including the University of Pittsburgh, where he was the dean, and the University of Chicago, uh, where his son David was also then a distinguished member of the faculty until his death last year. Professor Curry was a preeminent theorist on the conflict of laws. Uh, he was known to our students here at Duke as a gifted teacher. One of his students wrote after his untimely death that ideas were the essence of his classroom hour. It is fitting then that Duke has honored him for so many years with this distinguished lecture series. The series began in 1967, just after Professor Curry's death. It has brought scholars of the very first rank to Duke to address issues of national importance. And this year is no exception. Our lecturer this year, we're very fortunate to have her, is one of the preeminent constitutional scholars in the nation. Our own Professor Neil Siegel of Constitutional Law will introduce her. Neil. It's with great excitement that I introduce this year's Curry lecturer, Professor Pamela Carlin of Stanford Law School. Uh, Professor Carlin is a graduate of Yale University three times over, having received her bachelor's degree, master's degree, and law degree, all from Yale. Uh, she was a law clerk to Judge Sofair of the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York, and then a law clerk to Justice Harry Blackman of the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, those of you who have read Linda Greenhouse's uh, highly regarded biography of Justice Blackman may know that Professor Carlin shows up uh, four times in the book in, in my judgment, uh, significant roles. Uh, professor Carlin was a professor of law at University of Virginia Law School uh, before joining Stanford's faculty in 1998. At Stanford, uh, she has proven herself to be an obscenely productive scholar, an award-winning teacher, and I think it's fair to say a litigator of extraordinary skill. Uh, I do not overclaim. Specifically, she's the co-author of three leading case books in the areas of constitutional law and related fields. Uh, she has authored, I think, more than 50 scholarly articles. Uh, she's received multiple teaching awards. They seem to follow her wherever she teaches. And she is the founding director of Stanford's uh, remarkably successful Supreme Court litigation clinic. Just yesterday, I think, uh, Professor Carlin was at the Supreme Court uh, arguing an important voting rights case, Riley against Kennedy, uh, which presents the question whether states subject to the voting rights preclearance requirements must receive approval from the Department of Justice before implementing decisions of its highest court striking down previously pre-cleared state laws. I know some students these days and others like to engage in uh, fantasy play with sports, fantasy baseball, fantasy football. While I have my own habit in my free time, I have a fantasy con law team. And uh, uh, she's definitely a, a top draft pick every time I play with, my, with myself. Um, but really, uh, oh, I didn't even Watch mean that. Metaphor. I didn't even mean that. Uh, <laughs> I recently shared with my own mentor uh, at Yale Law School, Robert Post, that Professor Carlin would be visiting us here and giving the Curry Lecture this year. And uh, this is what Robert had to say. Uh, Pam is a force of nature. As a teacher, she's off the charts. As a lecturer, she's in a class by herself. And as a litigator, she is the gold standard. Um, coming from a scholar who distributes praise sparingly, I think that's quite a statement. Uh, today, Professor Carlin asks, what can Brown versus Board of Education do for you, and she will explore with us the ongoing struggle for ownership of the Equal Protection Clause. Now, Professor Carlin, welcome to Duke. Thanks. Well, thank you so much uh, for having me here. I think if we were really talking about fantasy baseball, I would find myself with this Supreme Court somewhere so far out in left field as to not even be there. Um, uh, and I was talking uh, earlier today um, with some of the students here over coffee 
Uh, and I was comparing uh, just, Justice Kennedy's questions yesterday uh, at the Supreme Court to a knuckleball, which if you know a lot about baseball, one of the things you know about the knuckleball is both the pitcher doesn't know where it's going uh, until it goes over the plate, and the batter doesn't know where it's coming from until it arrives. And so uh, I thought uh, I received a number of knuckleballs um, from Justice Kennedy, and I received some chin music from the chief. So I think uh, it's good that I'm at Duke this year, because by this time next year, you would not be calling it the extraordinarily successful Stanford Supreme Court litigation clinic anymore. Uh, we had two cases yesterday, and it's really going to be an interesting question whether we get five votes uh, between them. If you read the press coverage, you'll know that in the morning case, um, the government's lawyer was up at uh, the lectern for nine minutes of the 30 minutes and then sat down, which is a sign, I think, of what may happen there. Ah, well. While we still got a Supreme Court to talk about, I'm going to talk about the Supreme Court and um, my topic today, actually, I think is fitting in some ways with uh, Brainerd Curry, uh, not because it's about conflict of laws, but because it's about conflict over law. Or in particular, what turns out to be, as I think you'll see, and this is why I used the title, What Can Brown Do For You, uh, as the title of my talk, to be almost a trademark dispute over who owns Brown against Board of Education and who owns the meaning of Brown against Board of Education and what that meaning is. So today I'm going to do this by telling you a story about two of the most influential texts in American constitutional law. One of them is Brown itself, which was decided by the Supreme Court in 1954 and has become the most revered opinion in the Supreme Court's history and the most uh, super duper, to use uh, Senator Specter's phrase, of all of the Supreme Court's precedents. Now in 1959, uh, Herbert Wexler, a distinguished law professor at Columbia, published an article called Toward Neutral Principles of Constitutional Law, which has become the most cited law review article in American history. These two texts are linked by more than just their canonical status, because the final pages of Neutral Principles are in fact devoted to arguing that Brown cannot be squared with the demands of principled adjudication. What interests me is how the relationship between Brown on the one hand and neutral principles on the other has been transformed over the past half century. If neutral principles were remembered today primarily as a criticism about Brown against Board of Education, it would never have had so much staying power. Neutral principles would then be so clearly on the wrong side of history that citing Herbert Wexler's article would be a little bit like citing Dred Scott against Sanford for the proposition that uh, in a diversity case you have to make sure that the parties before you are citizens of different states, uh, which I advise you not to do. It's true, it says that, and it's true, you do have to do that, uh, but don't put those two things uh, together. Uh, but that's not how neutral principles is remembered. It's remembered instead for its title. Uh, it may be the piece that started the really quite disturbing trend in law review articles towards using the word toward, uh, which suggests in kind of falsely modest way, you're not actually getting there. You're just moving toward neutral principles. Um, and it's also remembered for its general statement of the features that make judicial review uh, acceptable and legitimate in a democracy. Its application of that framework to Brown against Board of Education is now almost entirely forgotten. And precisely because the tension between neutral principles, the article, and Brown, the decision, has been forgotten, we can now face a Supreme Court that treats Brown not as the antithesis of neutral principles, but as the apotheosis of neutral principles, in particular of a race-neutral principle of colorblindness as the essence of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. Neutral principles, the idea, if not neutral principles, the article, seems to be winning the struggle to claim Brown for itself. But that's certainly not how Brown against Board of Education was originally understood. So in my talk today, I want briefly to summarize some of the key points about the Supreme Court's decision in Brown and about Professor Wexler's initial criticism before turning to how the idea of neutrality was deployed by the Supreme Court in its most recent school desegregation case, the parents involved in community schools against Seattle school district case that was decided last year. Because one of the things I hope you take away from my talk today and from reconsidering the initial encounter between Brown and neutral principles is just how far the Supreme Court has strayed in parents involved from what Brown originally meant.
Brown, as you will remember, or if you haven't gotten there yet in constitutional law, as you will shortly find out, uh, involved a challenge to uh, the official maintenance of separate schools uh, for black and white students by black public school children and their parents. Chief Justice Warren's short but unanimous opinion for the court had two critical parts to it that I want to identify. The first of these explained why Brown went beyond the narrow originalism of trying to ascertain what the views of school segregation were that were held by the original drafters and ratifiers of the 14th Amendment in 1868. And the second big piece of Brown explained why, under contemporary conditions, separate schools were inherently unequal and thus violated the Constitution. So let me turn back for a moment to that point about the original uh, intent or the original meaning of the 14th Amendment. To say that the Supreme Court in Brown sidestepped that question after uh, arguing, after asking for rebriefing and re-argument of the case over essentially what 1868 had to tell us was not uh, to say that the Supreme Court ignored the original understanding. Um, to the contrary, the Supreme Court explicitly hearkened back to the earliest decisions under the 14th Amendment uh, which had located the meaning of the Reconstruction Amendments uh, in the particular history of black slavery and emancipation. So for example, if you go back to the slaughterhouse cases, have you all read the slaughterhouse cases yet? Right? The in incredibly important question of the right to be a butcher in, in New Orleans, right? So if you remember the slaughterhouse cases, the court there said that no one could fail to be uh, impressed with the one pervading purpose found in the Reconstruction Amendments, lying at the foundation of each, and without which none of them would have even been suggested. We mean the freedom of the slave race, the security and firm establishment of that freedom, and the protection of the newly made freeman and citizen from the oppression of those who had formerly exercised unlimited dominion over him. Thus, in the slaughterhouse cases, although Justice Miller recognized that the Reconstruction Amendments might be read more broadly than simply about black slavery in the South. Uh, he concluded that uh, what we do mean to say and what we mean to be understood is that in any fair and just construction of any section or phrase of these amendments, it's necessary to look to the purpose which we have said was the pervading spirit of them all, the evil that it was designed to remedy, and the process of continued addition to the Constitution until that purpose was supposed to be accomplished as far as constitutional law can accomplish it. Similarly, in the passage from Strauder against West Virginia, on which Chief Justice Warren relied in uh, Brown, he stated that the words of the 14th Amendment were directed at discriminations against black individuals, which are steps towards reducing them to the condition of a subject race. So if we were to put those early cases in their contemporary terms, the First, Amendments the first decisions construing the 14th Amendment had treated it as a prohibition on racial subordination and had recognized that the aspiration of the amendment was that blacks become full members of civic society. Now, it was in light of that understanding that the Brown Court turned to the constitutionality of public school segregation. And it said in words that are quite famous, that to separate black school children from others of similar age and qualifications solely because of their race, and here is uh, the important language, generates a feeling of inferiority as to their status in the community that may affect their hearts and minds in a way unlikely ever to be undone. And it was precisely because the policy of separating races was, as the court said, usually interpreted as denoting the inferiority of the Negro group that segregated educational facilities are inherently unequal and violative of the Equal Protection Clause. So the way I read that language in Brown and its reliance on the earlier cases is to say that, it was that the decision was directed not at an arbitrary or an irrelevant use of race in the way that we might have thought if some school system was segregating children on the basis of astrological sign or whether they were RH positive or RH negative blood types where you can't come up with any reason for it. Uh, but that the problem was an invidious use of race School segregation reinforced the subordinate status of black people and perpetuated the exclusion from mainstream society and institutions that dated back to the time of slavery. So having thought about Brown that way, it's really a puzzle when you read Herbert Wexler's Neutral Principles article. Because he sees a totally different Brown than I do. Uh, his starting point in the article 
which is set out near the beginning, is that courts function solely as an illegitimate naked power organ. I guess that's when he's playing with himself, Neil. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, but uh, courts function as an illegitimate naked power organ when they decide cases based solely on the identity of the parties before them. Thus, in the article, Wexler condemns the person who disapproves of a judicial decision when all he knows, this is Wexler's language, when all he knows is that it has sustained a claim put forward by a labor union or a taxpayer, a Negro or a segregationist, a corporation or a communist. Now, to be sure, Wexler is making an important point. In a wide variety of cases, the identity of the litigant should not matter to the outcome. It's hard to imagine, for example, a justification for denying a plaintiff in a medical malpractice case compensatory damages because she's a segregationist or because he's a communist. But it's not true that the identity of the litigants never matters. There are a wide array of cases in which the identity of the litigant is the central issue. So for example, the federal sentencing guidelines recommend that judges take into account whether a victim is unusually vulnerable or was selected because of her race, her religion, her ethnicity, her disability, or her sexual orientation. Sentencing course, courts often take into account a defendant's age. Sometimes the, li defendant's, uh, the, the litigant's identity is the hinge on which the entire case turns. In anti-discrimination law generally, for example, it's the race, or the sex, or the national origin, or the veteran status of the individual that entitles them to protection under the law in the first place. So it's not exactly true that uh, courts uh, or the law has to be neutral on these issues. It's just once the principle has been announced, uh, it should be applied fairly in the cases to which it applies, which has, of course, that wonderful circular quality to it. But even if you thought that uh, Professor Wexler was right, that the identity of the litigants shouldn't be the thing that determines whether we approve of or disapprove of uh, a case, uh, he seems to forget that the Supreme Court in Brown knew far more than the identity of the litigants. Uh, he rejects the idea that racial segregation can be, in principle, a denial of equality to the minority against whom it's directed, uh, because he forgets that the principle embodied in the Equal Protection Clause itself is that kind of principle. Because he insists on a kind of formal symmetry, Wexler denies that racial non-subordination can be a principle. How, he asks, can racial non-subordination be a neutral value? Now, in one sense, I don't understand Wexler's problem. Uh, as John Hart Ely famously later remarked, there are neutral principles of, of every hue. How about no racial segregation ever? Sounds like a neutral principle. But one needn't even go that far. Uh, to be sure, to say that the Constitution forbids the creation of racial outgroups is non-neutral with respect to race, as opposed to other kinds of people who can be treated as pariahs, criminals, for example. Uh, but the decisive constitutional principle in Brown itself is, as the Supreme Court initially understood, uh, not a neutral principle. But that non-neutrality is not a product of the judge's choice. It's a product of the constitutional choice itself, most explicitly, I think, in the 15th Amendment. And surely, um, Herbert Wexler is not saying the 15th Amendment is not a neutral principle that can be applied by courts because it forbids disenfranchisement on the basis of race, but not, for example, on the basis of not being a resident or not being a citizen or not being old enough or at the time not being male enough. Um, so I'm, as I say, a little bit puzzled about uh, Professor Wexler's point. Now, his having decided that you couldn't have a neutral principle of non-subordination leads him to look around for some other neutral principle that might be at play in Brown. Uh, and as he casts around for some other injury that black people might have suffered because of Jim Crow, other than exclusion from uh, uh, or discrimination, he comes up with the idea that the problem with, segrega with segregation was not that it discriminated against black people, but that it denied all people the right to associate across racial lines. And this idea produces perhaps the most notorious passage in the Neutral Principle article. And so I want to read this passage to you, which is, he says, uh, I think, and I hope not without foundation, 
that the Southern white also pays heavily for segregation, not only in the sense of guilt he must carry, but also in the benefits he is denied. In the days when I was joined with Charles H. Houston in litigation in the Supreme Court, before the present building was constructed, he did not suffer more than I in knowing we had to go to Union Station to lunch together during the recess. That is, in Washington, all of the local restaurants were segregated on the basis of law. Uh, the only integrated place you could eat lunch was at Union Station because it was under the control of the Interstate Commerce Commission because it was a train depot. And so what he's saying is, Charles Hamilton Houston and I couldn't eat together anywhere in Washington, and I was just as injured by that uh, as Charles Hamilton Houston was. Well, to paraphrase Charles Black's masterful response to, uh, to Professor Wexler, here is where the curves of self-satisfaction and obtuseness intersect at their respective maxima. <laughs> And so I think we ought to exercise, and this is also a line of Charles Black's, one of the sovereign prerogatives of philosophers, that of laughter. It's only because Wexler identified the relevant principle as a right of association that he was then confronted with the problem he found insoluble in Brown, which is finding a principled way, once you decide this is a case about the right to associate across racial lines, to pick between the black school children who wish to associate with that is to attend uh, schools that uh, were currently all white, and those who wished not to associate with them, namely whites who found uh, integration unpleasant or repugnant. If instead he had treated the question as one of equal civic status rather than equal government accommodation of individual preferences to associate or not, there would have been no difficulty in deciding that whites' desire to subordinate blacks and blacks' desire for equality were constitutionally different from one another. So he created a problem that he was then unable to solve, but he could have avoided uh, that issue altogether. Now, whether or not Brown against Board of Education was principled in the sense that uh, Wexler used that term, it marks the Supreme Court's greatest triumph. It transformed equal protection doctrine from what uh, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes derisively once called the usual last resort of constitutional argument uh, into a bedrock principle of constitutional law. Not for nothing did the Supreme Court later use the Equal Protection Clause as its vehicle for remaking the American political system in the reapportionment cases. Not for nothing did the Supreme Court use the Equal Protection Clause as its justification for resolving the presidential election of 2000. Precisely because Brown has become the crown jewel of the United States reports, every constitutional theory now has to claim Brown for itself. A constitutional theory that can't produce the result reached in Brown, the condemnation of de jure Jim Crow, is a constitutional theory without traction. And even uh, Robert Bork, whose judicial nomination foundered in no small part because of his article entitled Neutral Principles and Some First Amendment Problems, an article that was in some sense an homage to Herbert Wexler's article, noted that any constitutional theory that seeks acceptance must, as a matter of psychological fact, if not of logical necessity, account for the result in Brown. Now this is even more true when it comes to cases involving school desegregation, which of necessity must be true to Brown against Board of Education. So one of the most striking aspects of the Supreme Court's recent decision in the Seattle and Louisville schools case was the struggle there over what Brown meant. The policies involved in Parents Involved uh, were promulgated by elected local school boards in two jurisdictions, Seattle, Washington, uh, and Louisville, Kentucky. And in order to produce racially integrated schools in those two districts in the face of continued residential segregation, each school took race into account in some pupil assignments. The Supreme Court, by a five to four vote, held that both policies were unconstitutional. And what I want to concentrate on with you for the remainder of my time today is how the majority uses Brown against Board of Education in its opinion. We now live in a world of what we might call Brown originalism. The question is no longer what was the original meaning of the 14th Amendment in 1868. The court didn't look back to 1868 at all. 
Rather, the question is, what's the meaning of Brown against Board of Education? And for at least the past 30 years, it's been clear there are at least two ways of talking about what the meaning of Brown is. Uh, one way of talking about it is to use what's come to be known as the anti-classification rationale. It sees the evil at which Brown was directed and the central meaning of the Equal Protection Clause as being about a prohibition on the government distinguishing among individuals on the basis of impermissible criteria of which race is the epitome. Under this approach, uh, as Justice Kennedy said in Miller against Johnson, at the heart of the Constitution's guarantee of equal protection lies the simple command that the government must treat citizens as individuals, not simply components of a racial, religious, sexual, or national class. By contrast, uh, something that's come to be known as the anti-subordination or the anti-caste or the anti-subjugation principle of Brown views the promise of Brown as the full integration of African Americans into American society rather than as the abolition of formal racial distinctions. Now the parents involved majority came down squarely on the side of the anti-classification principle, which it tied back to the idea of neutrality that is, students of all races should be treated identically, and to a claim about Brown itself. When it comes to using race to assign children to schools, Chief Justice Roberts wrote, history will be heard. But the history here was not the history of the Civil War or the original history of uh, the 14th Amendment. Rather, it was simply the history of Brown itself. So here's something quite striking about the Supreme Court's opinion in Parents Involved. How many of you have read the opinion? Anybody read the opinion yet? OK, so a couple of you have read the opinion. Well, if you've read the um, long version of the opinion, the unexcerpted version, uh, it's 41 pages long, the opinion of the court. And although Brown and what the promise of Brown was looms over the entire case, it's not until page 39 that the court even cites Brown. And then the court quotes only a fragment of a single sentence. The, se the fragment is, the impact is greater when it has the sanction of law. That is, when the government uh, takes race into account, there's something distinctively evil about that. And so they have this uh, sentence fragment. The impact is greater when it has the sanction of law. And the parents involved court quotes that fragment to support its claim that it was not the inequality of the facilities, but the fact of legally separating children on the basis of race on which the court relied to find a constitutional violation in 1954. But let's place that sentence fragment back into the sentence from which it comes and the sentence immediately before. Because when you replace that fragment into its original context, the quotation from Brown shows how the court in parents involved has posed a false choice. The sentence that immediately precedes the quoted fragment goes like this. It says, segregation of white and colored children in public schools has a detrimental effect upon the colored children. And the remainder of the quoted sentence itself drives this point home. The impact is greater when it has the sanction of law for the policy of separating the races is usually interpreted as denoting the inferiority of the Negro group. In that context, the vice was not the provision of inferior tangible facilities, nor was it the simple separation of groups, the only choices that the parents involved court is giving us. Instead, the vice was subordination. Now, the parents involved court re recognized that the debate over which side is more faithful to the heritage of Brown is what the debate is about. But it thought the right answer, here again I quote the Chief Justice, could not have been clearer. To clinch this point that it couldn't have been clearer, the court, having declined to rely on the words of Brown itself, quoted from the oral argument in Brown instead. And here's what the court says. As counsel who appeared before this court for the plaintiffs in Brown put it, we have one fundamental contention which we will seek to develop in the course of this argument. And that contention is that no state has any authority under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment 
to use race as a factor in affording educational opportunities among its citizens. The court saw no ambiguity in that statement. What do the racial classifications do in these cases, it asked, if not determine admission to public schools on a racial basis? But as Justice Holmes long ago uh, remarked, a word is not a crystal, transparent and unchanged. It is the skin of a living thought and may vary greatly in color and content according to the circumstances and the time in which it is used. The lawyer who made the statement on which the court relied, Robert Carter, was speaking in 1954 in the context of pervasive Jim Crow, under which racial assignment produced racially segregated schools that had the purpose and effect of denying black school children the educational opportunities the majority provided to itself. When Judge Carter, who's now a distinguished federal judge, was asked for his reaction to the court's reliance on his oral argument, he responded sharply that all race was used for at that point in time was to deny equal opportunity to black people. It's to stand that argument on its head to use race the way they use it now. Now, Judge Carter's reaction is reminiscent of uh, the classic scene in Woody Allen's Annie Hall. How many of you have seen Annie Hall? OK, good. More of you than have read Parents Involved. <laughs> okay. So you may remember this scene. Woody Allen is standing in line outside of a movie theater. Uh, and he overhears the man in front of him who's talking about Marshall McLuhan and Marshall McLuhan's view of television. Uh, and Woody Allen turns to the guy and says, you don't know anything about Marshall McLuhan's work. And the man, who's kind of pompous, he's a professor after all, turns to him and says, really? Really? And here's what I just love. I happen to teach a class at Columbia. Right? Everything is a seamless web. I happen to teach a class at Columbia called TV, Media, and Culture. So I think my insights into Mr. McLuhan, well, they have a great deal of validity. And at that moment, Woody Allen says, oh, that's funny because I happen to have Marshall McLuhan right here with me. And he pulls Marshall McLuhan out from behind the pillar. And McLuhan looks at the guy and says, I heard, I heard what you were saying. You, you, know, you know nothing of my work. How you ever got to teach a course in anything is totally amazing. So we had a Marshall McLuhan moment. <laughs> now, the message of Brown for the parents involved majority is a symmetrical one. Before Brown, the court says, school children were told where they could and could not go to school based on the color of their skin. But as Justice Stevens noted in his dissent, there's a troubling kind of deracination to that account, which bears a startling resemblance, I suggest you, to Herbert Wexler's account of his lunch with Charles Hamilton Houston. So Justice Stevens says, this sentence reminds me of Anatole France's observation that the majestic equality of the law forbids rich and poor alike to sleep under bridges, to beg in the streets, and to steal their bread. The Chief Justice fails to note that it was only black school children who were so ordered. Indeed, the history books do not tell of white children struggling to attend black schools. Now, in the dark comedy, The Merchant of Venice, Antonio warns, mark you this, Bassanio, the devil can cite scripture for his purpose. Brown, in an important sense, is our national scripture. And I worry that it has now been so stripped of its original meaning and its original aspiration that it can be quoted as a, for any purpose and has been transformed into an obstacle for achieving the racially integrated society for which the Brown lawyers struggled. Thank you very much. This is before I saw what they do to me, in my case. <laughs> 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 you were very persuasive. Well, Neil has a question yeah, now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'd rather play with someone else. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm also very interested in Black's Lives Matter piece, because it's, it's coming up on the 50th anniversary. Yeah. Right? 1959, it was written. And it's really a phenomenon worth reflecting. Right? One of the leading lights all of law writes something about Brown that in retrospect, as a matter of his own legal craft, is really embarrassing. It is really truly embarrassing people now. And yet, it is the most cited piece ever 
why did this happen? Now you can have personal explanations, right? So the Houston piece, if you want to read it sympathetically, is something like, what about me? Or what about we white people? The Equal Protection Clause speaks for us too, right? Yeah. And there's a struggle for legitimacy that Brown inaugurates that comes to fruition in many ways in terms of evolved in which right, the dominant majority is saying, what about us, right? Um, but there's also a jurisprudential reason that I'm curious about, because it seems to me that the anti-subordination people, uh, the anti-subordination principle you articulate, and the anti-classification principle that Roberts articulates, and possibly others as well, all meet Westfield's own criteria of generality and neutrality. And so, so the question is, what is his jurisprudential problem around? And my own thinking is that he realized that his own criteria for legitimating what courts do were not sufficient to legitimate what the Brown Court did. No amount of neutrality and reason and principle and logic, traditional legal craft, was going to subdue Southern reaction to Brown. And so it had to be that, in some fundamental sense, Brown was not legitimate because he just didn't have the tools. To you mean because is that be He's doing, there he's trying to do a kind of preemptive run, which is, since the South isn't going to accept Brown, exactly. I need to explain that Brown isn't really good law because everything that's law will be accepted, and if this isn't accepted, right. then it can't be law. Right. The no. only way I have yeah. of having law be accepted is through this legal craft stuff, logic and reason or principle. And I know Brown is so controversial, and the South is so emphatically rejecting it. Right? He, in other words, the way modern scholars would talk about the need for public legitimacy, social legitimacy, the values the court enforces matters. Right? He wants to distance himself from that and talk about logic and reason and principle. Right? And yet he knows that's not going to work in Brown. So I'm wondering if that might be a jurisprudential reason that he has to sort of preempt the discussion and say there's no way to legitimate what the court is doing. Well, Gary Peller makes a su suggestion a little bit l like part of that. I, I actually think there are a couple of things going on here. One is um, a, a phenomenon that if you want to show you're really principled in some way, the way to show you're really principled is to say, this is something I would really like, but I can't get it. Right, that, you know, so it's who are you going to throw over the side of the lifeboat to show that you're really principled? I think a little bit of, of John Ely's Wages of Crying Wolf article in this way as well. And kind of in contemporary modern times, I feel a little bit this way about some of the folks um, in the same-sex marriage debate who, whose view is, I'll explain why there's no right to same-sex marriage because that'll allow me to show that even though I'm a lefty, I'm really, really principled because here's something that we on the left believe in, but I can't get there from here. Um, and so I think a little bit of it is that, which is a principle isn't a principle in some ways psychologically if it always leads to the same result you would choose as a matter of policy. Because the principle can't be, there's a famous old, I am the vicar of Bray, I think it is, which is, uh, because if I were not the vicar of Bray, I wouldn't be the vicar. And it's one of these things where as long as everything I believe in is principled, because if I believe in it, how could it be unprincipled? So there's a little bit of that, right? There's a little bit of, you know, if the, if, if the South is going to really resist this, then I should undercut it even more, which is a kind of peculiar way of, of going about things. And, and I'm not sure why saying, the original understanding of the 14th Amendment was that it was intended to include um, black people as full members of society wouldn't have been enough of a neutral principle. And he doesn't really confront that. And um, Lou Pollock's response to him, I think, does a really good job of saying, no, no, that's a neutral principle, right? Inclusion of slaves. Why is that not, it's slaves and their descendants, why is that not a neutral principle? Then why doesn't he say yeah. that? I, that's what I've never understood. I, except that, to be honest, Herbert Wexler was not exactly on the right side of everything. I mean, if you think about the three greatest achievements of Herbert Wexler's life, he was the lawyer for the government in Korematsu. Uh, <laughs> not so good. Uh, he did neutral principles. Not so great. Uh, and then model penal code. Quite painful. Um, you know, you can't exactly say the model penal code is evil in the way I think we can say Korematsu in retrospect was really quite evil. It may just be hindsight. I, you know, I honestly don't know. I'm really kind of interested in trying to figure out why he didn't see what, for example, Charles Black and Lou Pollock saw at the time, which is, uh, you know, it's eminently possible to come up with a neutral principle, why he didn't see that ultimately Brown would be quite successful. It's too bad he didn't wait like another three years because he really could have written the neutral principles point about the reapportionment revolution and be correct about it. That is, there isn't a way of looking at one person, one vote and locating it in the original aspiration of the Equal Protection Clause or in any sort of understanding of um, 
the Article I, Section 2 when it comes to the reapportionment of Congress or like, I mean, that's, that's a case where, you, you know, it, the court is picking from among various principles that are out there on a non-neutral basis that it thinks equality in voting is more important than some of the others. But I, I honestly don't know here why he comes up with the answer, with the answer he does. I mean, which is, you know, to say this is a case about uh, association, which of course also then creates even more of a difficulty on resistance. And you can see this from the fact that the Supreme Court decided Brown in 1954 and then dodged for the next 13 years the interracial marriage case, right? Which is about association, right? You know, so under his theory, they should have decided name against name, but not Brown against Board of Education. Name against name is the case that's the predecessor that the Supreme Court dodged to Loving against Virginia, right? So the Supreme Court should have decided Loving in 1954, but not decided Brown ever. And that seems, if you're right about, he's worried about resistance, boy, I would think that would be something the South would have been a lot more upset about. Indeed, that seemed to be a lot of a, what was driving the opposition to school integration is if kids go to school together, then they date, then they have sex, then they have babies. Not necessarily these days in that order. Um, but, you know, that seems to be much more of a worry. And indeed, if you look at the, the sort of strategy that the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, for which I worked before I went into teaching, uh, used in the school desegregation cases, it was to start with graduate school students and to start with like mid-career returning people who were already married. So you had these like 55-year-old guys who wanted to get like a master's degree in education because that seems the least threatening thing. And then they went to uh, elementary school students and it was only after that that they really made an effort at the college level, which is where people are most likely to be dead, right? You get to law school, you know, sweat against paper, you get to law school, there is no dating anymore, <laughs> right? So you don't have to worry about mixing then, but college, that's all people do is mix and mingle. You know, and those were the last cases they brought were the college cases because those were the ones that people were going to look bad at. So I, I, but you're right, it's a kind of puzzle. He just, he guessed wrong. He was on the wrong side of history. You know, he thought he might be on the right side, but I don't know. Yeah? So have these cases, these recent cases, have they sort of signaled the death of the anti-subordination rationale behind Brown? Or, I mean, where does it go from here? It, it, they've actually done something even odder than that because of Justice Kennedy's kind of concurrence and concurrence in the judgment. So here's the, the, the piece of the case I didn't talk about here is Justice Kennedy's uh, concurrence in the judgment, which tries to embrace simultaneously the anti-classification and the anti-subordination rationales in the following way. He says, of course, it would be a great thing to have racially integrated schools because that's a way of uh, you know, having civic inclusion and, uh, and equality and the like. And of course, school districts can take race into account to get there, but not in their treatment of individual students. So what Justice Kennedy says is you can decide where to put the schools, you can create magnet schools, you can draw the school zones uh, in a deliberately race conscious way. That is you're drawing the line north-south rather than east-west because that will create integrated schools in a jurisdiction where uh, the north and the south uh, is the way the uh, segregation is. Right? So he, he says you can take race into account. What you can't do is do it by pointing to individual students and saying duck, duck, goose with the students. But you can take into account these differences. And he says if you use uh, things like siting of schools or zoning of schools or creation of magnet programs in a deliberate attempt to create racially integrated schools, then he says strict scrutiny doesn't even apply. Now this is a stunning statement on his part. Because what he's saying is strict scrutiny applies to formal classifications on the basis of race, but not to race conscious actions. If he's right about this, and I think he's not, he's cha changing the doctrine dramatically. Because under that theory, Gamillion against Lightfoot, which some of you may have read, which was about changing the boundaries of Tuskegee from a square to a 28-sided thing, should not require strict scrutiny at all. Because after all, no individual person was told, you're black, you can't vote. It was simply a boundary siting decision. So I think the, the answer after Justice Kennedy is you can still care about anti-subordination and you can be race conscious in an attempt to avoid subordination or to create integration. But what you can't do is do it on the retail level. You have to do it on the wholesale level. Um, and this creates, of course, its own set of questions about candor, 
uh, and the difficulty of doing this on the wholesale level rather than the retail level. But I don't think, at least on the current court, that you have five votes to say the state can't care at all about integrating schools and has to be totally uh, race neutral. So that's kind, of, that's kind of where I think things are now. That's the optimistic part of me that thinks that's where things are now, right? The pessimistic part of me thinks, you know, just like one vote away from brown being turned upside brown. Yeah. Um, the facts of the situation underlying brown or what led to that decision, what facts led to this brown? Well, I, you know, I think some of it is the Supreme Court, you know, if you look back to, say, 1883 and the civil rights cases in 1883, one of the things the Supreme Court says there is, you know, there comes a time, the, the, the line they use is something like, there comes a time when uh, the freedmen have to, like, tr just be part of society like everybody else and protect their rights the way everybody else does. Therefore, Congress can't have anti-discrimination law. This is prior to the huge increase of the Commerce Clause. So I think what's happening now is the Supreme Court's decided, you know, the second reconstruction of the 1960s, starting with Brown and leading up through, say, the Voting Rights Act of 1964, uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 65, uh, that was intended to deal with the problem and we've solved that problem. And so the Supreme Court doesn't think, <coughs> four of the justices really don't think there's a racial problem in America anymore. And that's the fact that I think is driving them. I mean, I, I got a little bit of this sense also yesterday in my oral argument. You know, the Chief Justice basically said, yeah, yeah, you've told me there's 40 years of Voting Rights Act precedent on all of this, but you know, I'm gonna go back to the text and rethink the whole Voting Rights Act. Well, you can't dislodge these things from their experience. And the Supreme Court, you know, Justice, Justice um, Chief Justice Roberts says, the way to treat people equally is start treating them equally. Just treat them all the same right now. No taking race into account. Um, so it's a kind of social view of how you get beyond the problem of race in America is you just stop talking about it. And you sort of saw this a little bit also. There was an uh, op-ed in the New York Times maybe two days ago from William Crystal that says, let's not have a conversation about race. And that's, that's I think, the social view that, that, that's, that's leading to this. So let's not have a conversation, I guess. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Oh, you are so lucky. Oh, you are so lucky. Okay, great. Oh, you.